We are here tonight to study the book of Acts. In just a few minutes, we will be moving into Acts chapter 21. So I want to invite you and encourage you to get a Bible if you can and be looking this up in your own copy of the scriptures. That would certainly be helpful. Either a hard copy made out of uh, paper, uh, made out of dead trees, the real deal, a, a Bible, or maybe something on a device, whatever works for you. But we're heading for Acts chapter 21 in a few minutes. I hope you're all doing well tonight and enjoying this Wednesday, one of the, uh, the middle of the week here. I hope to see you all this worship, this coming Sunday for worship, either at 9 or 11. I hope all of us can be present for class at 10 o'clock as well as we continue our study from 2 Peter. And for our members, remember to use the Sign Up Genius account if you can to sign up for one of those two services. This would be a great time to do that, either right now or right after class. And remember, guests are always welcome. So if you're not able to sign up, uh, don't let that be a hindrance. Uh, for now, masks are still required in the city of Madison and in Dane County. So uh, thanks for your understanding with that. I know it's a difficult thing, but it looks like uh, there could be an end to this at some point. And I am looking forward to that. For now, I plan on just going outside right after uh, each service and class and be uh, be able to get together with you outside uh, in the fresh air and you know that as we've done over the past year and a half or so so I hope to see you this coming Sunday at 9 or 11 and then also at uh, 10 for class in between as I said, tonight we are continuing with our study of the book of Acts, the Acts of the Apostles, or more accurately, some of the Acts of some of the Apostles. And specifically, we've been looking at the Acts of Peter and Paul. So the book was written by Luke, the beloved physician, and it's written to a man named Theophilus, who might have been some kind of a government official, because Luke addresses him as the most excellent Theophilus, and that was a title that was often used of governors and kings. And so he's giving this man... Uh, either a new convert or a potential convert. He's giving him a history of the early church. Uh, by way of very brief review, we'll just run through these every time. I don't want to leave anybody out. If you're joining us for the first time tonight, we've been summarizing each chapter with the ABCs of Acts. So just a one, two, three, or four word summary, brief summary of each chapter, starting with a successive letter of the alphabet. So in chapter one, we had the ascension, the ascension of Jesus back into heaven, the beginning of the church in chapter two, the man who was carried and cured in chapter 3, determined disciples in chapter 4. In Acts 5, we had the empty jail. We had the first deacons, always with a question mark in chapter 6. In chapter 7, we had Stephen, who was the great hero in the sermon that he preached on that occasion that led to him being stoned to death. In Acts 8, we had the eunuch asking, how can I? That is, how can I understand the, the gospel unless someone guides me? And uh, thankfully, he had a guide for that, didn't he? So how can I? And then at chapter 9, I am Jesus. In chapter 10, we had the journey to Joppa. In chapter 11, uh, the reminder that the kingdom now includes Gentiles. So this was a huge turning point in the book of Acts. Gentiles are now brought into the kingdom in chapters 10 and now 11, as he explains it. In chapter 12, we had Peter liberated again, so set free from jail or prison again. In Acts 13, we had missionaries sent out. So this is kind of shifting over to Paul, his uh, first missionary journey there. In chapter 14, Paul and Barnabas had to convince the crowds that they are not gods but men. In chapter 15, we had the reminder that the old law is no longer binding. Old law not binding. In chapter 16, we had the Philippian jailer converted. Lydia was converted uh, there as well. In chapter 17, questions answered in Athens, with Paul preaching on the Areopagus in Athens, Greece. In chapter 18, reasoning with a preacher. So we had uh, Priscilla and Aquila pulling the preacher Apollos aside privately to explain to him the way of God more accurately. In chapter 19, we had saving our religious friends, as Paul questions and then baptizes the 12 men in Ephesus who had been baptized improperly the first time. And we learn from that it is not wrong uh, to question what somebody believes. And even though somebody's religious, it's okay to ask some questions, very pointed questions, which Paul did and set the example there for us. So saving our religious friends. In Acts 20, we had Troas on the Lord's Day, where Paul uh, preaches until midnight, even beyond, and you may remember there was the young man named Eutychus who fell asleep in the windowsill and fell out of the third story window, and he died, and Paul brought him back from the dead. And then the second half of Acts 20, as Paul continues on his way back to Jerusalem to deliver the famine relief, he stops very briefly in Miletus, which is a port city uh, not too far from Ephesus, and so he calls for the elders of the church in Ephesus. The overseers show up, 
And he tells these men to shepherd the church of God. And so we had the reminder that those three terms, uh, shepherd, overseer, and elder, all refer to the same office. And uh, Paul gives these men some encouragement. They need to be careful because wolves would arise from within the eldership, tearing up the congregation. So he basically says, you guys need to keep an eye on each other and keep each other strong through this because there are some difficult times on the horizon. Well, tonight we go over and we cross the line going over into Acts chapter 21. And as you can see on the screen here, if you're joining us online, uh, the summary for you, chapter 21, is uproar in Jerusalem. Uproar in Jerusalem. And if you haven't done this already, I would strongly encourage you, if you have a card copy of the Bible, to write these uh, by the chapter heading, I've done this in the Bibles that I've used through the years, and if you have the ability to make a notation in a digital Bible, go for it if you have that uh, capability there, but uproar in Jerusalem. However, we won't quite get to the uproar tonight. We will save that for next week if the Lord wills, so it's in the second half of this chapter. We're only making it, uh, I think, about 14 verses in. Uh, to chapter 21. So class may be a tiny bit shorter tonight. I'm not sure. We'll see as it, uh, as it goes along, but that's all right. If we had included the whole chapter, we would have been together for an hour and a half or two, and I, I don't want to do that to you. I don't want anybody falling out of the window dead. Nothing like that. So uh, we're, we're cutting it a little uh, shorter tonight with the first 14 verses. Uh, by way of review, we're on the tail end of Paul's third missionary journey. He's made the rounds here, as you can see from the green line on the screen there, and at this point, He's basically booking it back to Jerusalem with some famine relief. So he had the prophecy a few chapters back that there would be a famine. And so he makes this trip. He travels through Macedonia and Greece collecting funds or supplies of some kind from these Gentile congregations. And he's bringing this back to the church in Jerusalem to be distributed by the elders there. So tonight, Paul will leave Miletus. And he will set sail heading east toward Jerusalem. So that's where we are on the map. A lot of this uh, paragraph we're looking at here will be his travel uh, from west to east. So let's pick up tonight with Acts 21, Acts 21 verses 1 through 6, the first paragraph tonight. Acts 21, 1 through 6. When we had parted from them and had set sail, we ran a straight course to cause and the next day to Rhodes, and from there to Patara. And having found a ship crossing over to Phoenicia, we went aboard and set sail. When we came in sight of Cyprus, leaving it on the left, we kept sailing to Syria and landed at Tyre, for there the ship was to unload its cargo. After looking up the disciples, we stayed there seven days, and they kept telling Paul through the Spirit not to set foot in Jerusalem. When our days there were ended, we left and started on our journey while they all, with wives and children, escorted us until we were out of the city. After kneeling down on the beach and praying, we said farewell to one another. Then we went on board the ship, and they returned home again. All right, in verse 1, Paul leaves Miletus, and we know that Luke is with him, don't we? We have that clue here in the first verse here. Luke uses the word we. Uh, so this is a number, uh, one of several uh, we passages scattered throughout the book of Acts. So Luke joins in, I think it was back in Troas, and then he's kind of with them and not with them. Sometimes it's they did this, but every once in a while we get these passages where Luke uses the word we. And so Luke is obviously on the ship with the group at this point. We'll go back to the map a little bit, zoomed in a bit, uh, to show that when they leave Miletus, they ran a straight course to Cos, C-O-S, and then the next day to Rhodes, R-H-O-D-E-S, if you're joining us on the phone, and then from there to Patara. I've added my own little labels for the islands of Kaz and Rhodes. This was not on the original map that we borrowed from Bible Talk TV. And so I think the little line there kind of reminds us that uh, this is not an actual map. I mean, it is a map, but it's not a map map. It's kind of, a, kind of an artist rendering of an actual map. So they're on a ship. So they obviously don't cut across the land, do they, as indicated by the little green line up here. But they stop by these two islands on their way to Patara on the southern shore of Asia Minor. So Kaz and Rhodes and then to Patara. Uh, in Patara, once they get there, they find another ship heading to Phoenicia. So probably a larger ship. Maybe that was more uh, capable of handling the waves and the weather there on the Mediterranean Sea. That's kind of interesting that they kind of stayed near the shore. 
uh, going from Miletus to Cods to Rhodes to Patara. So maybe that was a smaller ship not capable of sailing out in the open sea. But uh, once they get to Phoenicia, they get on, again, maybe a larger ship. They get on board. They set sail. They pass by Cyprus. And Luke specifically mentions that Cyprus uh, passes by on the left. So kind of as the map indicates, they would have been able to look out on the left side of the ship and see Cyprus go by, or really <laughs> as they were passing by Cyprus, obviously. Uh, Cyprus, by the way, is, as I mentioned a few weeks ago, it's the one, to me at least, that looks a little bit like the United States. Uh, you can even make it out a little bit here on the artist rendering, but uh, Paul had spent some time in Cyprus on the first missionary journey. Uh, this is where Barnabas and John Mark went while Paul went on his second journey when they split up there in Acts chapter 15 at the end of the chapter. And so I'm assuming Luke makes a note of this, maybe it's something of a reminder. If I'm Paul, I'm probably watching Cyprus go by as I think about the time that I've spent on that island. If you've ever done any travel by boat or ship, you know, it's kind of interesting to look out and to think about those places that you're passing and maybe the things that are happening there. So I'm sure if I'm Paul, I'm uh, watching Cyprus go by and I'm reminiscing, I'm thinking, I'm wondering how people are doing there, that kind of thing. And so Luke points this out, that Cyprus passes by there on the left side. Uh, after passing Cyprus, they keep on sailing towards Syria, uh, landing in Tyre where uh, the ship is unable to uh, is able to unload the cargo. So the third missionary journey, it is just about to come to a close. They are almost all the way back to Jerusalem. They're getting a lot closer here. Uh, back to the text in verse 4, uh, Paul and Luke, obviously here along with him, they look up the disciples. And I love this. One of the best parts about traveling is to look up the disciples. I mean, you can see the Grand Canyon. You can see uh, Mount Rushmore. You can see Mount St. Helens. You can see all these beautiful places. But really, the best part of traveling is to stop in, maybe to a congregation of the Lord's people you've never been to before, and to stop in for a visit and to say hi and catch up with these people. And this is what Paul does here. So he looks up the disciples. He stays there for seven days, which is an interesting figure. I'm, we're not told. I'm assuming this is similar to what happened in Troas. Maybe they just missed the Lord's Day assembly. And so they stick around another week so that they can be there for the next one. And again, he's in a hurry. So he's not, he's not slacking here. It's not just relaxing for seven days, but he uh, does make a point of spending some time with the disciples as he travels. Uh, in the second half of verse four, the local disciples are uh, passing along a message from the Holy Spirit, which is interesting. So they're kind of warning Paul about the danger of what's coming next in Jerusalem. And this has been a bit of a challenge to me. This, uh, in this chapter, um, is, is Paul disobeying the Spirit by going to Jerusalem anyway? I mean, that's kind of one thing you may be able to get out of this. The Spirit seems to be warning him, uh, but is he disobeying or is it just more of a warning? So again, this is a challenge to me. Personally, I would take this not as a prohibition, as in, thou shalt not go to Jerusalem. I, I don't think I'd take it quite that way, but I think more as a warning. In other words, if I could paraphrase it, if you go to Jerusalem, uh, be prepared for something terrible to happen. So be ready for this. If you have any other thoughts on this personally, those of you who are joining us tonight in class, I would love to hear what you think about this. Um, to me, what Paul does here sounds very similar to what Jesus does back in Luke 9, 51. When the days were approaching for his ascension, he was determined to go to Jerusalem, or some translations say Jesus set his face to go to Jerusalem. And uh, this is what I'm doing. Nobody can stop me. Nobody can talk me out of it. I'm setting my face. It is not going to end well. Of course, Jesus was heading to his own crucifixion, but that did not slow him down. I am going to Jerusalem no matter what. No distractions. I will not turn aside to the right or to the left. And so there is a certain urgency in the life of Jesus after that passage in Luke 9, 51, when he sets his face to go toward Jerusalem. So it's almost like this is happening in Paul's life now. Uh, he's made a determination. He will go to Jerusalem. He's got this famine relief. It needs to get delivered. I will go there. And all along the way, it seems that his Christian friends and brothers and sisters are telling him, please, Paul, don't do this. And uh, certainly a very difficult decision for him to make. Uh, in the next few verses, Paul and his crew get ready to head out. And the disciples seem to travel with them for a little bit as they head out of the city toward the ship. So they are 
I don't know, milking this for all it's worth. They are spending as much time with Paul as they can. They're they're accompanying him toward the ship, even though they can't get on board. It'd be like us taking somebody to the airport, walking with them as far as we can, and then leaving them. And uh, Luke specifically tells us that they all traveled together, everyone along with the wives and the children. And this is such a neat reference in the book of Acts. In Miletus, as I mentioned by way of review earlier, Paul met with the elders on the beach there, so just the men. Uh, but here, the whole congregation seems to show up, so men, women, and children. And this group accompanies Paul to the ship. Uh, just a, a few notes on this, starting with the reminder that the children are involved here. Let's not miss that. Children are involved and I am so thankful to have had a, a very, very good experience with the Lord's Church when I was growing up. Um, I follow a preacher on social media. I follow him out in California. And it, it, he has some interesting things to say, but he's always cutting on his church experience as a kid. And he looks back, and it's awful. And he, over and over, he, he uh, rails on the fact like we never had expository sermons. It was only topical sermons. We never studied from the Old Testament. We always took things out of context and on and on and on. And I hear him rant on these things and I, I truly feel sorry for him. And I, I get a, a pit in my stomach. I'm just like, I, I wish he didn't have that terrible experience. Uh, maybe he's exaggerating. I don't know, but I feel sorry for the man. And, and it has affected uh, his teaching now. And so he's kind of changed. He's gone in some weird directions because of this. And whenever I hear him say those things about his experience with the Lord's Church as a kid, I am always thankful that it was not like that for me. We studied the whole Bible. We studied from the old. We studied from the new. I heard expository sermons. You guys know I grew up with a preacher who loved preaching straight from the Bible. So preaching through maybe a paragraph at a time and taking main points from the text itself, not just making up uh, topical stuff, whatever came to the top of his mind, but preaching from the word of God. So I had a good experience. And we come to verse five in this chapter, and I'm just thankful that the children are included here. Certainly they would have good memories from this event. The children got to meet the apostle Paul. And they heard the Apostle Paul pray, and they heard Paul the Apostle preach and teach. And so I am thankful for the children in this passage, and I'm also thankful for the good experience that I had personally with the Lord's Church as I was growing up. And I would also make just a brief comment on the fact that these people, they had some good fellowship. And over a period of only seven days, they, they seem to be pretty close, don't they? Just in the fact that they accompanied Paul to the ship. It wasn't just, oh, goodbye, see you later kind of thing. Uh, but they seem to be close, even after a very uh, relatively short amount of time. They've only been together for about a week, but at the end of that week, they, they seem to be close together. Um, there's an emotional bond, at least I, I seem to be picking that up here. Uh, I think of some of the groups that we've had come to help us here in Madison, and they've come to help us with some maybe special outreach projects through the years, uh, going door to door or service projects or helping with the clothing giveaway. We had the group come up from Illinois, from Freeport to put the roof on the church building. And so we spend time together and we eat together for a week and they stay in our homes for a few days and we get to know each other, uh, even after only a few days. And I think of those times when I've done this for other congregations. I remember driving up to Duluth, Minnesota to help the church out up there with my sister uh, back in high school or college, I don't know, my parents let, let us go up there. We had a good experience going door to door. Think of the, the trip to Montreal and uh, mission trips and gospel meetings, different places. And I'm just saying over a short period of time, you get pretty close to people. And uh, there's some good friendships that have formed on those trips that uh, we still maintain today. So maybe a similar thing going on here. Uh, but with this, Paul, he gets on the ship and the disciples head home again. So let's pick up with our last paragraph for tonight. This is Acts 21, verses 7 through 14. Acts 21, verses 7 through 14. When we had finished the voyage from Tyre, we arrived at Ptolemy. And after greeting the brethren, we stayed with them for a day. On the next day, we left and came to Caesarea. And entering the house of Philip the Evangelist, who was one of the seven, we stayed with him. Now this man had four virgin daughters who were prophetesses. As we were staying there for some days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. 
And coming to us, he took Paul's belt and bound his own feet and hands and said, This is what the Holy Spirit says. In this way, the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. When we had heard this, we as well as the local residents began begging him not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, What are you doing, weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be bound, but even to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And since he would not be persuaded, we fell silent, remarking, The will of the Lord be done. Back to our very rough and artistically inspired, uh, geographically challenged map. <laughs> and comparing it to the text, we find in the text that Paul and his crew, they set sail from Tyre. They then land in Ptolemy. And once again, they greet the brethren. And so, again, they connect with the church, just as they did with Troas, just as they did up in Tyre. Uh, they stay in Ptolemy just for a day. So this is a very quick stop. And then they head down to Caesarea. So if I understand this correctly, the green line really should go through the sea, shouldn't it? From Tyre to Ptolemy, and then go on land or sea from Ptolemy to Caesarea. We aren't really told whether this trip is by land or by sea. But the point is they make their way down to Caesarea. In Caesarea, they stay with Philip the Evangelist. This is not the Apostle Philip. Uh, this is Philip the Evangelist, and uh, this is one of the seven, which is an interesting reference. And so this is a reference back to Acts chapter 6 with those seven men who were appointed, uh, the first deacons, but with the question mark. And so it's kind of interesting here to me that many years later, um, these seven men take on almost kind of a legend status. They are the group. They are the seven. So just as we have the twelve, the twelve apostles, we have the seven. So at least he identifies this Philip since there are several um, back in Bible times. That was a common name. So uh, this is one of the seven, those seven men who were uh, up chosen and then appointed to uh, take care of the feeding of the Greek-speaking widows. Um, this is the same Philip then who was baptizing people in Samaria. Um, in our timeline, this takes place roughly 20 years after the last time we see Philip in Caesarea. Uh, you might remember after Philip left Samaria to go study and baptize the Ethiopian officer out in the wilderness, the man from Ethiopia went on his way rejoicing. And then Acts 8.40 says, But Philip found himself as a Zotus, and as he passed through, he kept preaching to all the cities until he came to Caesarea. So Philip lands in Caesarea and apparently stays there for the next 20 years. And this is significant because some have argued that an evangelist is by definition someone who constantly travels. In fact, there are some churches who regularly change preachers every two years or so. Uh, there are some preachers who make a point of changing churches every two years or so, in my opinion. My opinion is they run out of original material, and so they've got their, you know, 100 sermons that last them a couple years, and then they're out of material, and they stop studying, and they stop growing, and so they just move. That they're out of they're out of stuff to preach. They don't study on their own anymore, and so they just move to the next church. Well, obviously, the benefit of doing that is these men have almost unlimited time to visit, don't they? Well, I'm gonna. If I don't have to prepare any sermons, if I don't have to study, if I could just preach stuff I prepared 20 years ago over and over and over again, um, I can get a lot more done as a preacher. I can visit in the hospital every day. I can go from house to house even more than I am and, and that kind of thing. Of course, the uh, downside of that is the material is 20 years old, isn't it? And uh, the man stops growing personally and in his faith as a preacher. Um, so anyway, one answer to this is the example of Philip. So when somebody says, oh, look, Bible evangelists, they only travel, they didn't stay in one place, uh, we would say, wait a minute, consider Philip. So Philip moves to Caesarea after baptizing the man from Ethiopia, and he is apparently still living in Caesarea roughly 20 years later. An evangelist then uh, does not necessarily have to move every couple years. That is not part of the job description. Uh, the word evangelist, by the way, just means somebody who proclaims the good news. Uh, a preacher is just somebody who proclaims. And so a preacher would accurately describe the work of a gospel preacher, uh, but evangelist is just a little more specific. Not only is he a proclaimer, but he is a proclaimer of good news in particular. In fact, it seems Philip 
uh, settles in pretty well, doesn't he, here in Caesarea. He's described in verse 9 as having four virgin daughters who were prophetesses. And so this was not the life of living on the road where he didn't have time or funds to have a family. But Philip has a family, and they are apparently faithful to the Lord. His daughters were known for prophesying. Uh, to prophesy is to speak forth to speak forth on God's behalf. And it may involve telling the future. That's the way a lot of people say, oh, a prophet, that's a, that's a fortune teller, somebody who predicts the future, uh, perhaps, but not necessarily. Uh, literally, a prophet simply speaks forth on God's behalf. Uh, just as the White House has a press secretary, and her job is to communicate on behalf of the president, not on her own behalf. She's not communicating her own thoughts, right, in theory. Um, the press secretary's job is to, com to communicate the uh, wishes or the will of the president. So I hope you understand the comparison there. In the same way, prophets do not speak for themselves. They are speaking on God's behalf. In my mind, I picture them having a hotline to God. So God tells them what to say, and they say it. That's the job of a prophet. It may involve telling the future, but it may just involve speaking forth the word of God. Um, what makes this reference somewhat unusual is that these four are women. They are Philip's daughters, and so they are prophetesses. And to me, that is very hard to say. <laughs> the The plural of the word prophetess, prophetesses. That's just hard to, it's, it doesn't roll off the tongue. But uh, the word prophet is used, I believe, 241 times in the Bible. As far as I can tell, the word prophetess, the female form of that word, is only used about nine times. And so this is a rather unusual reference. Uh, going back in history, summarizing those other occurrences in Acts or in Exodus 15, we have a reference to Miriam, the prophetess. In Judges 4, we have a reference to Deborah, the prophetess. In 2 Kings 22 and 2 Chronicles 34, we have a reference to Huldah, the prophetess. In Isaiah 8, we have a passing reference to a prophetess conceiving and bearing a child. I don't think there's really a reference, if I remember correctly, to anything she actually prophesied, but she's just identified as a prophetess. In Nehemiah 6, we have a reference to Noadiah, the prophetess, apparently a false prophetess, a woman who was trying to uh, terrify and harass Nehemiah as he rebuilt the wall and did the work that he was doing. And then over in the New Testament, in Luke 2, we have a reference to Anna, the prophetess, who served in the temple and praised God when Jesus came to the temple as a baby. So Anna. And then in Revelation 2, we have a reference to a false prophetess by the name of Jezebel. So those are the other references to prophetesses in the Bible. In Peter's sermon in Acts 2, he referred to the prophecy from Joel, where God promised that in the last days he would pour out his spirit and that in those days their sons and their daughters would prophesy. So we have a little bit of a prediction of this. Um, then we have some regulations on women prophesying. In 1 Corinthians 11, uh, we're told that women must have their heads covered when prophesying. And Paul explains in that passage that their long hair is given to them as a covering. And then in 1 Corinthians 14, in the context of the miraculous spiritual gifts, including prophecy, uh, Paul says that the women are to keep silent in the churches, that is, in the assemblies, for they are not permitted to speak, but are to subject themselves just as the law also says. And so I'm just saying we do have a number of references to prophetesses in the Bible. We also have some rules or some restrictions on women serving as prophetesses. And I just say this because some people will take verse 9 out of context and they'll try to use it to say, whoa, look at that right there. We need to have women serving as preachers and elders today because look right there. It says that uh, Philip the evangelist, this respected man, he has four daughters serving as prophetesses. Therefore, you know, women should be able to preach and lead the singing and do everything publicly as men do today. And so we just need to be aware of this and we need to look at the larger context uh, there's nothing in this passage that suggests that Philip's four daughters in any way violated what Paul would go on to write in 1 Corinthians. Um, this is just a brief and passing reference. So I think we need to take all of that together. 
Um, you know, another complicating factor is we don't even have prophets today in the miraculous sense. So there's really nothing that's a, that's a perfect parallel here. But I would just take this passage as a reminder that Philip had four faithful daughters who served God faithfully. And I, I get that out of this passage. I don't know what you get out of this, but uh, I would also point out that this brief reference uh, reminds us that Luke had a way of elevating women in his writing. And we've talked about this from when we started the book of Luke. And we had the reminder as we started the book of Acts and really all the way through it. And even in Acts, we have some very positive references to women in this, uh, this history of the church from Lydia and Priscilla and Dorcas and now these uh, four daughters referred to as being prophetesses. Um, by the way, some have suggested that Luke perhaps uses his time here to interview Philip to uh, get his side of the story, to get some information from him that he includes earlier in this book. So maybe uh, the details about Philip preaching in Samaria, maybe the details about uh, preaching to the Ethiopian officer. And that's just interesting to me. So Luke is on this journey. He spends some time there in Philip's house, and this would certainly give him an opportunity to get some firsthand information that he can then share with us in the book of Acts that we've already looked at. In verse 10, as they are still in Caesarea for a few days, a prophet named Agabus comes down from Judea. Um, on the map, Caesarea is actually northwest of Judea. Most of us would say we were going up to Caesarea. But we need to remember uh, the elevation over there. And I know I've pointed this out a time or two because it does come up from time to time. People will say, oh, look, there's a mistake in the Bible. It says down when he went up or whatever. Um, Caesarea was on the Mediterranean Sea. It was a port city. Uh, but Judea is in the mountains, and so the prophet really did go down to Caesarea, down in elevation, even though Caesarea was to the northwest. Uh, when I was at the Bear Valley Lectures in September, I attended several lectures out in their library. And as I was sitting there listening to the lectures, I kind of looked over, and on the reference desk, I saw a 3D map of Israel. It wasn't large. It was maybe 8 by 18 inches, but you could actually feel it. And it, it had the bumps. You could see mountains. You could see the, the Dead Sea being down there below sea level and so on. And, and you could feel it. And it, it, to me, it made it really easy to envision the land of Israel as I had never really envisioned it before. I mean, we see these two-dimensional maps and it's okay. You, you get directions, but you don't really get the elevation. Um, sometime I would, I would love for us to study a Bible geography. I, I looked this up to see if I could get it for myself, the, uh, the actual 3D map of Israel. And at first it was a little out of my price range, you know, like $35. I'm like, ah, I don't know if I want to do that for a map, but uh, I think I put it on my wish list. So it's there. And last time I looked, I don't even know if it's available anymore, but uh, kind of a neat thing. I'll keep an eye out for it. And again, if we could study Bible geography for a few months, I think that would be interesting. And I've wanted to do that for a time. I cannot figure out how to organize a class on Bible geography. Do you do it by region? Do you do it by time period? How do you how do you organize that? I don't know, uh, but hopefully at some point in the future we can do that. But I just for now, uh, let's just briefly note that Caesarea really is down from Judea, even though it is located to the northwest. Uh, this is, I think, the second reference to Agabus. The first, I think, was back in Acts eleven twenty eight when Agabus predicted the famine in Jerusalem. So Paul is now returning to Jerusalem with famine relief. So it's kind of like, hey, man, I, I listened to you. <laughs> we, we're preparing for this. Uh, but anyway, the prophet Agabus comes down. He uses this graphic illustration, doesn't he? So he, he doesn't just warn Paul verbally, that is by using words. But like some of the prophets from the Old Testament, like Jeremiah and Ezekiel and the others, he, he uses a visual aid. And uh, those of you who are teachers, I know, will appreciate this. He's not just speaking, but he is showing and he is telling. And this is something they can, you know, touch and, and so on. And so very visual, tactile as well. You could both feel and see this. So he takes Paul's belt. And so there's some kind of handoff here. I mean, either he says, hey, Paul, can I borrow your belt for a minute? <laughs> or he comes up and he physically removes Paul's belt himself. I don't know, but he takes Paul's belt and then he binds, he ties together his own hands and feet. And the message from the Holy Spirit is in this way. The Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. And he gets his point across, doesn't he? 
the message is not misunderstood. They get it. It is clearly communicated. In verse 12, Luke includes himself again here, and he says, When we had heard this, we, as well as the local residents, began begging him not to go up to Jerusalem. Again, notice the reference to going up to Jerusalem. That's up in elevation, not north versus south. They're actually going south uh, to the southeast, uh, but going up into the mountains toward Jerusalem. But the locals, as well as Paul's missionary team, are begging him to avoid Jerusalem. Please do not go. And again, I'm, I'm struggling a tiny bit with this one. The Holy Spirit doesn't seem to be preventing Paul from going, as the Spirit prevented him from turning aside into Asia on the second missionary journey in Acts 16. So it's not that. It's not really prevention. But this seems to be more of a warning. Um, you can go. God will not stop you from going, but it will probably not end well. So maybe he's giving Paul the choice and he, he wants him to have a heads up. This is what's going to happen when you get there. So in verse 13, Paul responds, what are you doing weeping and breaking my heart? For I'm ready not only to be bound, but even to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And I'm just thinking of Peter. Didn't Peter try to prevent Jesus from going to Jerusalem? And, and wasn't that the, the scenario when Jesus said something like, get behind me, Satan? And um, this is almost Paul kind of following in the footsteps of Jesus. He's heading for Jerusalem. Some terrible things are going to happen, but he's determined to go. So Paul uh, seems to be a bit stubborn here. But what I'm thankful for is that God has a way of using stubborn people. Peter was stubborn. Moses was somewhat stubborn. But God has a way of using a strong-willed people. Um, but Paul, he's serving the Lord through all this with no regard for his own life. His friends can see that they are completely incapable of changing his mind, and so they stop. <laughs> they give up. And their conclusion is, the will of the Lord be done. And by the way, this is very similar to the attitude of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, isn't it? Uh, the night before his crucifixion, praying for God's will to be done, even though it would mean suffering for himself personally. Uh, this is a good place for us to take a break tonight. So Paul is still making his way back to Jerusalem. He's almost there. He's closer than he was at the beginning of this chapter. And he continues to encourage the disciples along the way. And uh, next week, Paul will finally get there, I believe. And uh, that's where we'll find the uproar in Jerusalem. Uh, thank you again for taking time to study with us tonight. We're glad that you were able to join us. I hope all of you can be together with us for worship on Sunday, either at 9 or 11. Uh, let's not get used to this online thing. We need to be together as a Christian family and, and plan on joining us between those two services for a Bible study at 10. And let me know between now and then if you have anything that uh, we need to be praying about as a congregation. Uh, let's close tonight by going to God together in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we're thankful for this history of the early church. We look around us and we realize that we are right now writing the history of the church right here in the Madison area. We pray that in this process we would represent you well so that future generations will be able to look back and to be encouraged by the work that we're doing here now. We pray that you would bless the elders of the congregation with strength and wisdom and courage, that we would take our work seriously, knowing that souls are at stake, knowing that eternity is at stake. We pray that we would be united as a congregation, not complaining, not grumbling, not murmuring, but constantly looking for ways to encourage each other, finding ways to serve you as we serve one another. Thank you, Father, for being so patient with us, both personally and as a congregation. We're thankful for your grace and your forgiveness. And tonight we pray for your continued mercy upon us. Be with the seniors of this congregation. Bless their caregivers and bless those who are facing special health challenges. We come to you tonight in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen.